This is how I started my eulogy for Charlie Knoxon. When he died on New Year's Eve, just as we entered the year 2020, when he was 20 years old. Charlie strove to make sense of the world. He read voraciously, he sought understanding. He never wanted to lose his faculties, even when going under anesthesia for surgery. Charlie wanted to make sense of things, but the refrain of the last few days has only been, none of this makes any sense. Because this time, we've reached the outer limits of human understanding. There are medical and technical explanations of what happened up on that mountain, but there are no existential answers, no theological answers. There is no sense. And when there's no sense, there remains only deep and profound sadness and love, all-encompassing, death-defying, universe-bending love. Well, that was nearly three years ago. And I have watched in the course of that time how you, Christopher, and how Genji have fought to hold that profound sadness, that all-encompassing, death-defying, universe-bending love. How you've wept and loved and written and made art, trying to find every day presence in the absence. Today, as we go into Yiskor, I invite Christopher Noxon to come up and help us hold memory as he shares a word of how he is holding his beloved Charlie now and forever. Dear Charlie, can you hear me? Can you hear us? I think maybe you can, or at least the chances of you listening are better today, here with all of us together, dressed in white, tender of mind, gathered to pray and sing and face the thing that we normally avoid, the thing that took you away from us. Also this place, it was so important to you, this exact spot, really it was in that other gym, the one around the corner, that was where you stood in your fancy suit and became a bar mitzvah doing what felt like two hours of Hebrew trope and that incredible Devar Torah about the value of apologies and why you said sorry all the time and maybe given how things are going down here, maybe God needs to be the one doing the apologizing. Yashir Koach to that. Other things I remember from that time is you storming out of the family dinner the night before, wrecked with nerves and pissed off at your dumb and demanding parents, individuating your heart out. All of us bunched up under the canopy, seeing family and friends and community, feeling that blessing deep in our bodies and souls. And then the party at Yamashiro's, you wolfing down plate after plate of sushi with your Limudim buddies, and then me kicking out those two random party crashers, and, and then all of us dancing to God help us Gangam style. <laughs> the whole thing was joyful and extravagant and sweet and spiked with annoyance and boredom and altogether precious. And that's like your life. And when I think about that, I'm okay. It's okay. Charlie Knoxon had a bright and beautiful life. But it is impossible <laughs> to separate your death from that story. It's okay. <laughs> you made a sudden and senseless exit, and we miss you so much. And really, Charlie, why did you go? Maybe that's the reason that you kept saying sorry. It's not like we can just concentrate on the sweet memories of you and avoid the fact that your death hurts because it hurts too much, especially today. We have to face it. Today, we're called to be here for it. And so today, here's what I want to say about that. I want you back. I hate that you're gone. 
The pain of it is excruciating and cannot be gotten over. There's no moving on. There's no letting you go. But also your exit cracked me open. Everything feels more vivid now, more intense, more emotional, more fragile. I see the tightrope under our wobbly feet. I feel the void down below. Before you died, I flinched and avoided people who were experiencing tragedy or profound loss. And now, now those are my people. I want to move towards them. I want to be with them because I recognize that they are all of us. I've learned something about presence, about trying not to solve or fix things, but just to show up and face it together. Because all we need, all I needed, all that I can be offered, really, is just to be with. In the end, that's what we've got, withness. And your leaving made this real and unavoidable Death is coming for everyone I love, and for me, and for everyone in this room, and no one can say when. Your death was like the slam of a door that shattered whatever protection I had against this fact. And so I'm a lot less safe now. I'm more nervous. I get irritated more often. (laughs) I'm scared to travel. I know the ground may not hold, that the balance might shift, things go sideways fast, I've seen it. But I'm also more often now overtaken by that thing that Heschel called radical awe, at the light coming through the windows in the morning, at the sound of a song, at the touch of a loved one, I cry a lot more. (laughs) It's all just so joyful and extravagant and sweet and precious, and it'll all be gone before we know it. Grief is what we get as people who love. Loss is love. And I love you so much, Charlie. I don't understand why you left. But I thank you for loving us while you were here and for teaching us now that you're gone. Yashikawa. <laughs>